Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to fellowship before the throne of grace. We praise you for who you are and for the wonders of your grace and love and for your precious word. We recognize as we feast upon it that we're dealing with the infinite word of the sovereign God. May, may we approach it reverently and soberly, submitting this time and ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Filter out the air, dear Lord, but just seal to our hearts the truth of thy word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The Holy Spirit's given us an example. He's given us an, an example in the person of Paul, who from the human standpoint, he could, you know, could lay claim to, to uh, human attainment that, that few of us today, if any, could match. And yet the Holy Spirit has us understand that all of that is, he, could, he regarded all that as but rubbish compared to the wonders of the finished work of Christ that was applied to us by grace. We got down then to the... Uh, to the 18th and the 19th verses just after we had been encouraged to walk according to the level of our attainment as we've received an understanding of what God has done for us in Christ. Uh, we're all at different levels of spiritual growth and 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 if in anything we're otherwise minded, God's going to reveal that to us individually. So as the Holy Spirit ministers truth to us, we grow we grow in the, in the knowledge that he gives us. In verses 18 and 19, we were cautioned that there are many who don't walk that way. And, and I suggested that these ones that the Holy Spirit mentions, uh, though they're, they're said to be enemies of the cross of Christ, uh, that many of these are, are of our brothers, they are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It would seem to me that the Holy Spirit would not be describing those who are Satan's children, but rather those who are the members of God's family who are not walking according to the truth. Now, I recognize that the word enemy and, uh, and that the, the word uh, destruction are used both ways, different ways in the word of God, but we also have the, the same word used of Christians, for example, in Romans, don't destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Same word. Don't ruin your brother for whom Christ died. And, and clearly the context as we, as we went through Romans is that this is to, to put that brother back under law. Therefore, I am still convinced that we're looking at the majority of Christianity, so I'm persuaded that, the, that these who walk contrary to the truth of the finished work of Christ are the enemies of his cross. Uh, Romans chapter 8, if you remember uh, when we studied through that book, if you, if, if you live after the flesh, you shall die, but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live uh, I do not believe that those who live after the flesh go to hell and those who live after the spirit go to heaven. And many Christians believe that, that nonsense, but that's not what the text is saying. You know, uh, not at all. Now, heaven and hell is not, uh, it's not based on the manner of your life. Uh, heaven is, is not dependent upon how you live, but on the finished work of Christ. And, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the majority of Christian thinking today does just that. They, they believe in such nonsense as that. Most of my Christian friends believe that if you live after the flesh, you'll go to hell. But if you live according to the Spirit, you'll go to heaven. So, our, so what they're saying is our destiny depends entirely on how we behave and how we function, how we live. And I believe that that's contrary to Scripture. Okay? We don't put our brother in hell 
Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, d destroy not thy brother for him. If that's hell, then, then w dearly beloved, we're not, we are not putting the man in hell. We are putting him back under law so that he falls from grace. The text says that we need to be, and right here in our own study, it says that we need to be on our guard. The walk to which we are called here is a walk in the confidence of the finished work of Christ. And these, we saw these people have a, a belly, they have an appetite for, for human merit. For doing something to be made righteous, uh, to obtain righteousness, uh, uh, to merit blessing in the eyes of God, which in fact reduces the work of Christ to, to naught, to zero. Whose mind or who minds earthly things, who mind earthly things, whose mind is set on earthly things. That's if you remember in Colossians chapter two, when we went through Colossians, beware lest any man spoil you of uh, you spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Legalism, law, human merit. It's a theological verse. If you died with Christ, which you did, that's a first class condition. Since you died with Christ, then why are you subject to the ordinances of men? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Uh, you, you know, we know that, that uh, all of these, they perish with the using. These are men's commandments. They're not God's commandments. God doesn't say touch not, taste not, handle not. God says you're called unto liberty. Just don't use your liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Many of you remember our study through Colossians. Since, on the other hand, you've been raised with Christ, then set your affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, not on things on the earth. What are the things on the earth? The flesh, law. And now back here in Philippians, we read, whose mind are on earthly things, we are commanded not to set our minds on earthly things. And everybody says, well, yeah, that's, and I know what that is. That's going bowling on Sunday or that's going fishing on Sunday or that's, folks, these people have set their minds on earthly things. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit gives me the right to write in whatever I choose to call earthly things there, okay? You know, such as, you know, if you think it's, you know, well, earthly things, that's like wearing lipstick, you know, or you shouldn't wear lipstick. Or, or, you know, if you think that every man ought to wear a tie or every woman ought to wear a hat in, in church and you can, you know, you can go down, you can make a long, long list of what you think earthly things are and you can call that earthly things. And that's not what the text is saying. And so we set, we set the rules and we fill in the blanks for earthly things and and I believe that that destroys the entire subject of the verse or the purpose of the verse. Minding earthly things is the human merit system. The very things that Paul called rubbish, garbage. And that's where these people are walking, walking. Now, I'm more than willing to admit that, that these may very well include Satan's children, but the context declares that, the, that these are those in the body of Christ who do not walk by grace, but by law, and they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross, the cross that crucifies, the cross that crucifies self, the cross that he was the effectiveness of what Christ did. Enemies of the cross, all that, that was accomplished on our behalf through the cross of Christ, as well as our being identified with him in his death, death to self. They're enemies of the cross. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't say that they are Christ's enemies. I'm, I'm to love my enemies. Never in my life have I, have I had anyone as mean and, and as hateful to me as Christians have been. No person that I could logically assume to be a child of the devil has ever treated me as badly as some Christians have. And that's just the truth. That's, you know, I hate to say that, but that's just the truth of the matter.
And I hear the Lord Jesus Christ say to love my enemies, do good to those who despitefully use you. And the entire context is speaking of God's children. So to proclaim human merit is to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. Why did Christ die? You know, the argument is if there had been a law given which could have imparted life, then surely righteousness would have been by the law. But God has concluded all men under, uh, under sin that the righteousness of God by the faithfulness of Christ might be ours, not by anything we've done, but by what he did. And, and though the word uh, clearly declares that he is both the author and the finisher of our faith, the popular message preached today is that he began something that we've got to finish. He started it, but we got to finish it. You know, folks, Moses killed the, uh, the Egyptian and then he, the dirty rat hid his body in the sand rather than calling the police, yet I've never heard my legalistic friends suggest that Moses went to hell or King David for murdering Uriah and stealing his wife Bathsheba. Yet they seem to have no problem whatsoever applying that legal standard to themselves or or me, anything that we add to the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross is to tell me that his work was insufficient, it, it was not enough, it, his work is not finished, and yet God tells me it is. And I believe that the great argument of grace is that we live like what we are. We don't live in order to become something that we're not. You know, folks, it has to be the saddest thing to the heart of God that most of his children do not comprehend what he's done for them in Christ. And, and I've mentioned this before. I, I truly, it seems, it seems to me that it must be close to blasphemy to, to take and put our works side by side with the person in the work of Christ. But it sobers me to realize that God has given me an area in which to work. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. I'm not under law. And I can't add anything to the finished work of Christ. But God has given me an area in which to work. And that area is grace. Dearly beloved, we would not be able to sing deliverances of the Lord unless we knew defeat. It is when we're, we're weak that we're strong. Most Christians are trying to be strong. They're trying to be, you know, it's, they'll talk about, you know, strength in, in the sense that, well, God gave me strength. Uh, I think they have a, a, the whole wrong idea of that. They, they just don't seem to grasp the fact that it's Christianity is Christ. The, the, the Christian can actually stand in the way, be a hindrance to the manifestation of Christ in our lives. Self is very real. All of you, all of you folks here listening who are trying to conquer the flesh, you're in for a rude, rude awakening. All right, you will not win. You will not win. Yours is not the call to control, but the call to surrender, to, of submission. To submit yourselves, we submit ourselves to God and His grace. This is what God is asking us to do. If, there's, if there is anything, anything called victory in your life, it, it came through defeat. You know, self it was exposed as the imposter that it is. The victory is ours because why? Because we, we, we were such great examples of, of human conduct, you know, great moral, you know. I mean, come on, folks. Look, you, you don't really believe that. The victory is ours because Christ always causes us to triumph. Not, not partially either, but not sometimes he does that, but always causes us to triumph. He always gives us the victory. 
Because why? Why is that? Because what he did is, was perfect. It, what he did was finished. His work is finished. And the problem in your life and in mine is not that we don't have it. It's not that we don't have something. Oh, I just need something. God has, God has just so neglected me. You know, this other Christian, he's, he's, he's received so much more from the Lord. Folks, that is not true. Okay? It's not that we don't have it, but that we don't recognize we have it. So we don't live like who we are. We're not living as God's children. We're living as children of the flesh, trying to invoke the blessing and invoke the merit of God by how we perform rather than living our lives out of, out of love for our Redeemer who's done so much for us, who, who has, by grace, gifted us so much. What does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? Well, first of all, I mean, we've received it. Don't miss that part. I mean, the heart of God is employing, he's beseeching us, he's imploring us to enter into a relationship that he's already established. We passed out of death into life. Our responsibility in this affair is to believe Him, to, to trust Him, to receive God's grace in vain, is to act as if you haven't. You know, I don't get over to our own website very often. I'm ashamed to say that, but, you know, I was on there last night, and I had to, I had to, had to, to pass this uh, along to most of you who've never probably even been to our website, but... It's something I wrote and put on there. It's about what is a Christian. You can read this definition on the website on our website. Now I, there can be a thousand definitions of what a Christian is. You, pe Christians can write their own feelings about what what that what it means to be a Christian all day long, and much of it can be true. Some of it cannot be true. It doesn't make what I've written exactly, perfectly, systematically right. But a Christian, folks, is one who by the grace of God can declare that he justly deserves the wrath of God, but for the mercy of Christ alone, he casts aside all hope in his, in his own self-righteousness, and he puts away all pride in his own goodness. He, he is one who is glad to be regarded as spiritually bankrupt and saved completely, totally saved by the free grace and the righteousness of Christ, and by the sheer mercy of God. He's been granted a grateful heart, which yields in, a, an, in allegiance to Him alone as Lord and a supremely sovereign God. In a word, it's one who glories in Christ Jesus and has no confidence in the flesh. The, just the very thing that I see here in, in our present study. The problem, as I see it, has to do with something as basic as, as the Christian's identity. If we don't, folks, if we don't know who we are, we're going to pretend to be something that we're not. First of all, we saw that our citizenship is and always will be in heaven. Not that it's going to be. This isn't something that, that someday will be true. It's something that's true today. Back to Colossians, who hath, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us, that's all of us, that's not some of us, all of us, into the kingdom of his dear son. When? When did that happen? When Christ died. It's already done. That's where our citizenship is. And, and, and it's, get this, from whence, from whence, I want to, I need to stick that on my fridge. From whence we eagerly anticipate the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. I thought it was from here that we were eagerly anticipating. No, it's from whence. Okay? From whence. Where? Where He is. That's where we, we eagerly anticipate His coming. Who will exchange our lowly body. That's collective body. That's in... Now, you could take the singular there in the grammar as being our singular individual bodies, but it's, it's, it's singular. I believe it's talking about the corporate, the collective body of, 
of Christ, changing that into his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. Dearly beloved and longed for. Dearly beloved and longed for. So we're going to cross over into chapter 4 here and, and hopefully, hopefully we'll uh, see how this ties together. Dearly beloved and longed for. Folks, don't close your Bible and go to sleep at Philippians 3.21. There wasn't any chapter division. Whereby he is able to, su to subdue all things unto himself. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Wow, I mean, twice we got a, a double, double whammy here. Twice we're called dearly, we're, ta we're called beloved. Twice God lo says he loves, loves us. Okay. Twice, right there, twice, you know, together. And so many Christians don't even know or believe or understand just how much God loves them. That's just one verse. A loving God who deeply longs for us is commanding us to stand firm in who we are and where we are. Not just who we are, but where we are. Because of the perfect finished work of Christ. Don't... It, don't just see, folks, that the Philippians were Paul's joy and crown. We are our Savior's joy and crown. We're looking down. We're looking down. We've been raised with Christ, co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We're looking down from our position in Christ above, from whence we eagerly anticipate our Lord. That's, that's strange language, folks. I mean, we, only God can write something like that. from where we eagerly anticipate our Lord. Don't miss that. We are to stand firm. Now, it, it doesn't say walk, behavior, con our conduct. It's standing, okay? We are to stand firm in that position while we're here below. We're not, folks, we're not just looking up. We're looking down from above down from our position in him above we're redeemed but we wait for the adoption of our body and i believe that 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 redemption is in view here that i'm going to have to have a change in my physical body of of humiliation of defeat to to a body like that of christ that's true, but I'm, I'm reading it as a collective body. It's, the word is singular. The word fashion means conformed. We will be inwardly as well as outwardly like his glorious body. And we need to not miss seeing that the enemies of the cross can also be citizens. My brothers, my sisters in Christ. Those who have attained an understanding of the work of Christ, as well as those who have not. Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. We are looking at the heart of Christ to the body of Christ. The first verse, therefore, my dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, folks, God longs to be with us. We saw that in chapter 1. We see here the longing of the heart of God that we walk in the provisions that He's made. And it really, really, really impresses me to see how many times God says He loves me. We, we see the longing of God's heart. We see that we are His joy and His crown. God loves me. He takes joy in me. And I am His crown. Yes, we can we can just we can just glimpse at the fact that how that Paul said that the Philippians were his joy and his crown, but I remind you of who the author is here. God loves me. He takes joy in me, and I am his crown, his reward. 
not because we live better moral lives that, that we have confidence in the flesh, but that we live in the confidence of the person in the work of Christ. Uh, if you re remember back in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 13, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, which killed the prophets and stoned them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her, her, her chicks under her wings, and, and you would not. Are we to assume that our Lord was weeping over those who were not his? That he was praying for the children of the devil? These were his people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. These were his people. Verse 2, I beseech uh, Eudeus and Syntech that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, we don't know what their dispute was. We don't, there's nothing else written on them. You know, I'm into biblical names. So in biblical names, the meaning of the name Syntech is one that speaks uh, uh, Euodia means fragrant. Okay, and I think I think names mean something. Okay, nobody names their baby. Blah, 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 blah. You know, names mean something. But name meanings is really not the focus here. Nothing else is said about them, so we're tempted to look at the name meanings and make something out of that. And I, I can't, I don't see anything in that, folks. I really don't. I think, I do think names mean something, but it's not the focus here. One that speaks and fragrant needed to be to get along. They needed to be of the same mind. Apparently, something was going on. We don't know what that was, but, but I think the context strongly suggest the dispute was likely between law and grace but i can't i can't say for certain because i just don't know because we're not told verse three and i, I entreat thee also true yoke fellow help those women which labored with me in the gospel with clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life the text seems to be telling me that we need to help one another along in this walk of grace Folks, ministry, it, true ministry is to the body first, which then equips the body to reach the lost. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's, there's a double exhortation. Folks, just stop for a minute and, and ask yourself, why would every one of us, every one of us, I don't care how sloppy your life is, how messed up it is. You're called to rejoice. Why would every one of us be called to rejoice? You'd think, well, only the good the Christians that are really doing a good job of, of, of being a Christian, you know, those are the ones that are to rejoice. Every one of us is called to rejoice. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The word uh, says clearly that the Lord is at hand. The Greek says the Lord is near. Now, now that can mean near as in coming soon or near as in our, he's in our midst. Okay, today. I like both those ideas, but... But looking at how the word is used elsewhere, I believe it's speaking of our Lord's near return, which motivates us to that, to that gentleness. Think back on how that our Lord, who when he was reviled, he, he didn't revile it back again. Uh, when he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. God will, will soon return and judge that, which we seem to want to, so often be the judge of today. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Verse 6, no, no wonder then we are to be careful, anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made un known unto God. Now, why would we, we all collectively, every single one of us, no matter how sloppy your, our life is, 
how messed up it is, why would we all be called to give thanks in all things? God longs for this communion with us, dearly beloved. He longs for it. And the peace of God. We have peace with God. That peace which passes all understanding, it, it most certainly does, shall guard, shall keep. That's a future active indicative. It's the, the mood of, of certainty, absolute certainty, that he will definitely guard. And that's a prison guard. Uh, the word is, is, is guard. It, it pro properly, it means to keep watch like a military guard. It means to actively display whatever defensive and offensive uh, measures are, are, are needed to, to guard. That's what God has promised. Every spiritual need has been fulfilled. Therefore, we continually give thanks. We, we always rejoice. We rejoice always in our Lord and, and what He's done in our lives. Not, not just what he's done, what he's doing, what he's done in the past, what he's doing in the present, what he'll do in the future. Knowing we have peace with God, not because of anything we've done. And these are the things that we are to help one another, okay, along in. These are the things that we share in common. And I'm so thankful to share those things with you all. I'm so grateful for the comments that you leave me on this channel. Those really mean a lot. They encourage me. Know that you're in my prayers constantly. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.